So cosmic rays, um, I'm sure you've heard about this in the con context of integrated circuits <coughs> and that it can cause bit flips. Uh, you've probably heard less about it in the, in the context of SSDs. And um, what I'm hoping to talk about in the next 30, 40 minutes is how much um, this actually matters to SSDs. And in fact, it's probably the dominant source of silent errors in SSDs or at least one of the dominant sources of silent errors. Um, so what, what I wanted to do is talk about, you know, what are, what are the particles involved in causing these um, bit flips? Um, I'll call these soft errors going forward. Um, and, um, and then after that, what's the physics involved in, uh, in actually causing current pulses that cause the bit flips? And then get to our um, measurement results. So the particles involved. Um, so cosmic rays are essentially protons that come from the sun or from more distant stars. They're greater than 95% protons. Um, about 4% is alpha particles, which is a helium nucleus. And then about 1% is even heavier ions. So they come at high energies and they enter our atmosphere. And then um, in this uh, um, cartoon here, what we show is what happens when they enter our atmosphere. So the protons come in, they start interacting with the air molecules, uh, with the nitrogen or the carbon in, in our um, atmosphere. And various reactions happen, and protons are created, more protons are created, and neutrons are created as well. And it's a cascade reaction, so as you go deeper and deeper into the atmosphere, more and more neutrons are created. And at some point, a maximum flux of neutrons exists at a certain altitude. And then they start getting attenuated as you get closer and closer to the Earth's surface. So the numbers start to decrease again. Um, but still, um, on the surface of the Earth, um, we have a very large flux of neutrons. We're, we're literally swimming in them. <coughs> um, it, it, any given second, there's about 20 neutrons going through a person, um, and because they're neutral, there's uh, usually they just go through without any problem, uh, but they do cause sometimes a, a change in your DNA, and actually that's what causes uh, mutations, and you know, that's a different topic, but, um, but, in, but in the same mechanism, they can also cause um, bit flips, and I'll go, go into the physics of that um, in a second. So um, as far as neutrons are con concerned, because they are neutral, not charged, they don't react with um, the sea of electrons, um, they essentially travel very far in matter. So it's not practical to, to shield um, against neutrons. So you, you really need several feet of concrete. Um, several meters. Several meters, yes. If you, if you really want to <coughs> shield it out to zero, you need several meters. Um, <laughs> then there's yet another particle to worry about when we talk about soft errors, and that is um, the alpha particle, which is essentially a helium nucleus. So here we're talking about two neutrons and two protons uh, as one particle. And these are generally um, generated within the package itself of the integrated circuit. Usually it comes from the lead solder bumps. And um, even if we manage to get, these are essentially uh, radioactive impurities that ex exist in the lead. And even if we manage to you know, get very pure lead these days, you know, one part per billion uh, pure lead, uh, we still get about an alpha particle uh, per centimeter squared per thousand hours. And uh, as you'll see in the next slide, um, and this is where I go into a little bit of the physics and how the, the, these um, particles actually cause a bit flip. Um, let, let's first t talk about the alpha particle case. Uh, here, uh, a charged particle comes in, and I have sort of a cartoon diagram of, uh, of a transistor showing an NMOS transistor there. Um, 
you have the source and the drain and um, the P substrate. The, electron, uh, the alpha particle comes in and it interacts with the electrons in the silicon substrate and it creates electron hole pairs. So basically what it's doing is it's imparting enough energy to the electrons to take it from the valence band to the conduction, conduction band. So you have some extra free electrons. And now if, these, uh, if this happens close to the junction, the source strain junction, um, there is a depletion region in that, re in that junction. You, you might remember from the device physics days from a college course. Um, th this region here has a strong electric field and so the electrons literally get sucked into the output of the transistor and you see a current pulse on the output. And um, that's what I'm showing here in sort of a cartoon form um, where an alpha particle current pulse tends to be very much um, lower but longer in time, about a 60 to 100 picosecond current pulse versus a neutron current pulse. And how, do, how does this work then for neutrons? Because neutrons are neutral, so they don't um, interact with the electrons. But what happens is every once in a while, the neutron gets close enough to a silicon nucleus that a different force comes into play, the strong nuclear force, which we don't talk about in everyday life because it's a very short range force. Um, and that causes the silicon nucleus to go to some excited state and then it disintegrates and you have basically a shower of charged particles that come out. It could be anything. It could be another alpha particle. It could be a much heavier carbon nucleus, for example, which, has got, uh, which is much more massive. And uh, this much more massive charged particle goes along the substrate, uh, basically depositing large amounts of charge as it travels through the substrate. <coughs> so you, have, you see this very intense pulse at the output of the transistor. And so in, in, in a circuit like this, which is basically the cross-coupled inverters that you see in standard SRAM, when one of the transistors sees a big current pulse like that, you basically can go from one metastable state to the other metastable state. So that's, that's the bit, flipped, bit flip that I'm calling a soft, soft error. So the, the summary here is that you know, alpha particles are much less frequent, but they generate electron hole pairs every time. So they, generate, uh, they cause soft errors almost at about the same rate as neutrons in today's technologies. Uh, neutrons, most of them go through, but the ones that, d that do have this kind of uh, interaction create these humongous current pulses that can affect many, many um, cells at the same time. The path of these can go for several, several microns, um, tens of microns. And today's uh, you know, SRAM cell is probably half a micron in width. So this can span, this can, one particle can take out you know, several, uh, several cells. Oh, on, your, on your diagram there, if you go back to it. Yes. Um, on the, the one on the, the left, the neutron. Yes. Does that c then have a permanent damage to that cell that can then continually cause it, it to be unstable? No. So this, this, is only, um, this is only a current pulse or a glitch. There's no permanent damage to the oxide or uh, anything in the transistor. And uh, this can happen even in static logic when you have a chain of inverters, for example, and you have a glitch. And usually that doesn't cause a problem because if the glitch doesn't get latched later on by a, by a sequential, it's okay. Uh, in this case, in that kind of circuit, even that glitch is enough to basically tip the, the stored state from you know, whatever is stored to the, uh, to the opposite state. Yeah, all this was a big problem with DRAM back in the day when they were using ceramic packages. Mm. The package generated so many alpha particles. Let me go back to what you said earlier. You yeah. said that um, you mentioned the size of the particle versus the size of cells. Was yes, it? yes. So what, so what was that number again? The size of the particle's trajectory can be tens of microns. Okay. And the size of cells today, in today's technology, is about half a micron width and height. And, and by trajectory, you're, you mean the radius of interaction, right? Yes. Big words. College boy. 
<clears throat> I got an A in quantum mechanics. <laughs> So that just means that you don't understand it better than everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was the okay, of the day. Day. <laughs> Justin, one, <laughs> word, zero. Okay. <laughs> we're going to quote him and we're going to all retreat it. So that <laughs> That's right, I'm not a Steven. Well played. <laughs> <laughs> We return your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so let's talk about the different media. So that we talked about this earlier. Uh, hmm. The flash media in, in the uh, SSD is essentially invulnerable to this uh, kind of um, particle strikes. And, and, that, and that's a good thing. And, and the reason why is because um, the, all the charge is stored in a floating gate. So you're essentially isolated from the substrate. So whatever charge is deposited in the substrate <coughs> is never um, felt in the floating gate because you, you have an isolation oxide there. Um, DRAM, as, as you mentioned earlier, um, used to be uh, vulnerable almost at the same rate as SRAM. But um, capacitances are larger in DRAM and um, as you shrink more and more, for example, in SRAM sizes are, have been shrinking, capacitances have been shrinking, so you would need less and less charge to cause a bit <coughs> flip. And um, in SRAM's case, if, while we're scaling down, we're not scaling down in size because SRAM has gone 3D. So they've been able to maintain the high capacitance and still put more and more SRAM. Whereas for uh, more and more DRAM. Whereas for SRAM, we've been scaling feature size and, and therefore capacitance, which causes SRAM to become more and more vulnerable per, on a per bit basis. Uh, where, whereas DRAM uh, has become less vulnerable. So, so essentially the difference between SRAM and DRAM as far as this kind of bit flip mechanism goes is uh, about six orders of magnitude. So really, it's the SRAM in any SSD that's vulnerable to this kind of effect. And also, all the latches and flops, any kind of CMOS logic um, along the data path. So um, it's, the, it's the controller um, in the SSD that is really a problem that causes this kind of bit, um, that is vulnerable to this kind of bit flips. And um, so without, being aware of this, um, it's very easy for us to be overwhelmed um, by these kind of bit flips um, and actually have silent error corruption rates that are um, significantly <coughs> higher than we would have, than we would have guessed um, okay, or, or even anticipated. Mm -hmm. So SRAM, is, is that volatile or non-volatile in this context? It's volatile. So if the, the flash media in SSDs is not vulnerable to particle to do soft errors. Yes. Does that mean that basically you'd have to have something taking place at the time a read or write operation was taking was happening? If you have something hitting SRAM, a particle hitting SRAM at the time a read or write operation is taking place, that's when you're going to potentially get a soft yeah. error. Yes. Now, how is that going to? Yeah, but it's also always moving data through SRAM to do garbage collection. Correct. Understood, but the underlying data is still okay. Except it's, if it's on a write operation, correct? It, it, so if it's on a write, that's when you have a problem. A read, it doesn't matter. It, yeah, Except it, it's going to return the wrong data to the application. But it, exactly. long term, it doesn't matter. It's only on a write operation when it happens to be flowing through SRAM. Y yes, that, that, that's partially correct. I would say uh, there's also more to it in the sense that the control logic that controls the CPU is also vulnerable to it. So sometimes the control logic can take a hit. And the firmware um, ends up doing something completely unexpected. So, Got it. so that also can happen. Okay, so that, in that case, it could end up writing data that you didn't expect or something like that. Yes. Okay. So uh, it's a good segue because, uh, as we talked about, so this is typically what, if everything goes well, this is what we expect to happen. You know, hosts write some data, it goes to the transfer buffer, it makes it to the NAND media. And um, the read would be um, simply the reverse. Um, but if um, things don't go right, 
and you have a bit flip occurring somewhere, whether it's in the data path or it's in the control logic, then you, have, you can have many different issues happening. The most obvious is data comes in, goes, gets to the transfer buffer, and a bit flips there, uh, and the wrong data gets written to the, to the NAND, NAND media. Can, um, can I ask you a question? Sure. So, I mean, this is great stuff, and I'm, I'm kind of processing it asynchronously here. <laughs> um, so about what you said the, 10 minutes stop, ago. Stop, stop. Um, yeah, yeah, so about what you said 10 minutes ago. So you, you had two slides where the one slide explained in great detail how... And, and, you know, and I asked you about the, the microns and, yes. and all of that. And then the next slide said, well, but then Flash isn't necessarily susceptible to that. How do yes. those two statements go together? Yes. So the, the Flash media itself, so all of this, th these kinds of errors are actually happening in the controller and not in the Flash. So, but, but then why the discussion about the cells and... The, I'm talking about the SRAM cells, not the flash cells. Oh, the cells. SRAM cells. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you yeah. know what? Yeah, I knew that. that was, that's what I typed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. This is the first time I've ever laughed talking about quantum mechanics. Does that too? The other thing is that you can also have... Um, bit flips happen, just like we talked about a second ago, bit flip happening in the control logic, and the firmware can do something completely unexpected. And um, this would lead to all kinds of uh, unpredictable results. And, um, and finally, the, the other thing that can happen is the controller can also go into some sort of a, uh, state where it's, it's not responding, and a write is, uh, has been acknowledged, and you think the, the right has happened, but it, it in fact didn't happen. And um, this is, again, another source of um, um, silent data corruption, right? Because basically you thought the right was completed, and next time when you, when you actually go to read that LBA, you read stale data. Um, so what is typically done in, in controllers to, to combat this problem? Um, usually, um, the, the thing we do is to add ECC or parity in the, in the caches. Um, and um, this is uh, pretty uh, standard uh, practice, even though um, if you look at a distribution of drives among different manufacturers, um, some manufacturers will have ECC in some of the biggest buffers, like the transfer buffer, and other manufacturers won't, will choose not to have any protection at all. So, safe to say that the ones that don't have protection are much more vulnerable to these kind of silent data corruption than the, <coughs> the ones that do. It, uh, can, are you okay with me appending a phrase at the end of your first? So, your fixes are at least detects most of the time. Can I add most, most of, the of the time? Because there's still, you can have a hash collision and you can have two, you can have, the ECC says it's okay and it actually is not okay. I mean, yes. It, really, it, really, really rare. Yes, it can that's happen. That's how we get undetected. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. It, it can happen. And actually, that's one thing that I talk about a little bit in the next, next slide okay. as well. Yeah. Um, really hope. Do you have any slides that are good? Like when you go, and this is how we fix it. This is really depressing. <laughs> like good news. Zoom. Yeah. But you, do you have an answer somewhere in here? We're doomed. We're doomed. For the record, our slides are really horrible later. Okay. <laughs> These are the good slides. But we I didn't mean qualitative on the slides. We meant the news. <laughs> Because we've seen bad, bad slides. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just isn't getting any better. Just saying. But not and I have been yeah. taking classes on how to write a horror movie. <laughs> close. But I think you, were, you were saying it's not. It's, it's not. It's worse than what James was saying, right? Yeah. So I'm Much saying, worse. Is uh, yeah. The problem. Yeah. <laughs> it gets worse. We're a little <laughs> tiny problem everywhere. That's so <laughs> the other thing is that uh, you can apply. Um, CRC right when the data comes in, and you basically have CRC all the way through the data path. So that, that's a sort of an end-to-end -end data protection that, that one can have. 
uh, which pretty much protects against um, this kind of thing. Uh, so, the, so the good news is it's, it's fairly easy to design a controller um, to, to prevent silent data corruption. It's just the awareness needs to be there that this kind of thing can happen. And um, how often does it really happen? That's what we wanted to find out, and that's why we exposed these controllers to this kind of um, uh, radiation that I was talking about, neutrons and alpha particles, and actually measuring uh, how often this occurs. And if it, if do you it, do that here, can we play with the accelerators? Or drink coffee near it. <laughs> Make it Howard proof. Yeah. <laughs> so on that, so you did actually. So you, what you stripped off a lot of the other protective parts of the thing, and then exposed it to a neutron source of some yes, kind. Yes. Yes. Okay. We did. That is very cool. Um, I always wanted my own particle accelerator. <clears throat> so um, to your point, ECC doesn't always work, and this is one of the one of the um, reasons why it doesn't work. You know, you have. You could have ECC such as single error correct, double error detect, sec, sec dead. Um, but if you take out three cells in the same word lines, three bits in the same word line, that ECC doesn't work anymore. And in fact, it doesn't even detect it. It just goes silent. Um, so this um, one of the techniques that, um, that, that we use is to interleave the, the bits so that physically bits that belong to the same word are never right next, next to each other. So this way, even if multiple bits are taken out by a single particle, um, we don't cause um, uh, a silent event. Um, and um, the other thing is when we can always do um, uh, the firmware can always be watching for certain heuristics and say that you know if something strange is happening, um, rather than um, hang the drive and let it reboot, break the drive. Uh, this is to prevent silent data corruption at the cost of uh, you know, increasing the annual failure rate. <clears throat> and so these kinds of policies can be varied depending on which market you're targeting. If silent data corruption is very important, then firmware can uh, be much more aggressive about breaking the drive um, than just letting it reboot. Um, so for as long as uh, silent data corruption is concerned for, for the enterprise segment, uh, it's, it's ba basically um, going for zero tolerance, meaning you know, trying to achieve numbers that are 1e to the minus 20 or lower. 1e um, to the minus 25, for example, you know, is, is, is eight zeros and a 1% um, per year. So it's essentially zero tolerance. <coughs> And um, that's, the, that's usually the, uh, the approach that one takes when they're targeting the enterprise segment uh, for, for silent data corruption. So um, how, do we, how do we validate this? So this is what we're coming to about you know, putting it under a, under a neutron beam. Um, traditional testing methods uh, you know, is, is never going to be able to measure rates which are down in 1 e to the minus 20. Uh, you have, even if you have 1,000 drives running for 1,000 hours, usually you can only get down to, um, you know, reading 1 e, to, 1 e to the 18 bits or so. Uh, getting another two or three orders of magnitude is just not possible under standard <coughs> conditions. So you need some sort of accelerated uh, testing. And... Um, so that's what uh, we do uh, when we take these drives and put and actually expose it to radiation um, in di in different places. So one of the places uh, someone mentioned Los Alamos earlier. So one of the places where we actually take these drives to is the Los Alamos National Lab. Um, and you don't say hello when you're in town. <laughs> <laughs> and um, these uh, the, there's a. Uh, Los Alamos Neutron Science Center actually makes its beam, uh, neutron beam available to um, VLSI companies, and we, we actually go there and take our SSDs and expose, <coughs> expose hundreds of our drives and our competitor drives um, to um, neutron beam and see what kind of um, SDC rate we can, we can get from this. Um, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, 
So the the undetected bit error rate for fiber channel is 10 to the 12th. So yeah, but like this what's, is, what's no, no, the what's the point of having a device that's yeah. better than that if the transmission the, medium is the detected bit error rate that's acceptable in a fiber channel interconnect is one times ten to the minus twelve, and then the CRC will capture it. Ca capture it. Catch it. You put the CRC on it. That takes the undetected rate down into the one to the minus twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven sort of a range within the interconnect. I thought it was the undetected bit error rate. Mm, the undetected is down in the range of 1 minus 25, 26, 27. Okay. It's in that Read. range. Okay. All right. That's acceptable detected rate and still not failing the link. Okay. But still people worry about hash collisions at 1 in 10 to the 100th. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And um, there, there are a couple of other ways of also doing it. One is uh, we also go to Indiana University Cyclotron facility that's um, uh, no longer online anymore, but we used to do that. And um, basically, you can see the picture. You have basically about 100 drives, up to 100 drives, you know, side by side and stacked one behind the other in the path of the beam. And then we, uh, the beam is usually about... 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th, uh, more intense than the radiation we get uh, in right here in the room. So we achieve an acceleration factor of 7 to 8 orders of magnitude. That's how we're able to test to see if we're able to meet this, you know, goals of 10 to the minus 20 or 10 to the minus 25. So you have to be doing operations at the time, right? Yes. You're not, you're not talking about corrupting data that's there. You're, like, writing data as you're running the beam. Exactly, yes. So... That's what the next uh, slide talks about, is uh, there's a test script that basically does random read-write workload. Uh, so the, the script writes the drive, um, a, a portion of the drive, say an 80 gigabyte portion of the drive. And um, it's basically writing and reading. We try to be about a 50% writes and reads. And um, while the beam is on, whenever it reads data, it continuously checks to see if there was any silent data corruption while the beam was on. Eventually, the drive hangs. So there's some problem with the controller execution of the firmware, and the drive stops working. From being bombarded with <laughs> yes. alpha particles? Okay. Yes. So you know, even, even if it was not, the, the theory is even if it was not, it would hang eventually, even right, right here. But we just have to wait forever. We've just accelerated it by you know, seven or eight orders of uh, magnitude. And um, after the drive hangs, though, what the test script does is it, it reads the data. It knows what data was supposed to be there in the NAND. Um, and it uh, reads it back to see if there was, again, any uh, silent data corruption events. Um, and it only, do, it only checks for silent data corruption if the read or the write was, the write was acknowledged as being complete. Um, so if, if the write was never acknowledged as being complete, that's a different category. We'll call that as a lost command. Um, so here's uh, some uh, results. So um, for this particular Intel drive was uh, tested, 156 drives um, uh, under the beam. And... Um, Eventually, the, as I mentioned, the drive is going to hang. The question is, what happens after the hang? Um, does the drive come back to life? And when it comes back to life, is there silent data uh, corruption? Does it, does it have bad data that, it, that it's not going to report? Um, in this particular case, uh, the drive uh, hung um, and rebooted only five times out of the um, 156 times that it, that it that it hung. So um, basically what's happening is the, the firmware in all these occasions was in doubt whether there was, you know, whether the data was um, corrupted or not. And it essentially took the decision to break the drive. I, now, I, I, I don't understand. You said it, it hung 156 times, but only came back five. I, I don't know. Yes. How can it? How can it hang 151 times and not come back? I don't understand. The, the drive bricked the, the oh, remaining times. Like, like my laptop. Oh, it's not the same drive. Back. You're just saying of 156 yes. drives, <laughs> only five of them yes. 
Okay. So, so we sacrifice a bunch of drives. We, bring, we can always bring it back to life after bringing it back. But okay. yeah. Unless you have power. <laughs> yeah. So what, oh, yeah. what that if means you is that 151 so we'll of the drives that we tested turned into bricks. Right. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And we would rather do that than give you the wrong data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't want the wrong data. You'll, you'll, you'll find a brick. Right. It's not silent. Yeah. <laughs> it's very not silent. <laughs> this one is going to crash through your windows. Yeah. Sorry. But the storage <laughs> systems that... <laughs> that was... That's funny. And, and also, when you're, when you're doing that kind of aggressive bricking, you want to make sure that your annual failure rate now suddenly doesn't you know, increase what you're specifying as what you want your annual failure rate to be. Uh, typically, that number is about 0.44. Um, and you can see that in this particular case, uh, the, br the brick rate was, was significantly lower. So um, this kind of bricking policy doesn't really increase the, um, the annual failure rate um, significantly. Um, so for an enterprise customer, this would, this would be a good solution because we're not causing uh, silent data corruption at the same time we're, all, uh, we're preventing silent data corruption, and at the same time, we're not increasing the brick rate um, to unacceptable levels. Okay, now I want an S3700 that's been irradiated to the point where there's Cherenkov radiation. Yeah. Actually, <coughs> we have to leave it there for, for several months before we actually can bring it back. <laughs> oh, yeah! <laughs> Don't make me aggressively brick you. <laughs> <clears throat> So, th and this is and not, this wasn't true for, for all the drives uh, that we uh, tested. This is uh, uh, another drive, a competitor drive. And in this particular case, uh, the drive came back to life every time. Uh, but 17 out of the 18 times, um, there was a silent error in, in the drive. So, uh, so that, that's one or more errors? Yes, one or more errors. Okay. <laughs> Um, so this, this, is, uh, this is very telling um, that this does happen and can happen. And um, if you're not paying attention both to the physical design of the controller and firmware policy isn't also taking all of this into account, you could really end up with um, silent uh, data corruption at uh, higher rates uh, than you would have uh, ever anticipated. Did you do these tests with the upcoming drive? That were... Not yet. So we have, we have plans to do That would be really testing. interesting to see if... We will, for yeah, sure. I'm sure you will, yeah. <laughs> we will, for sure. Um, so just a couple of more um, slides on this. Um, so this, this one shows the, the hang rate versus the brick rate. So um, a drive <coughs> bricks every time that it, that it hangs is going to fall all along the, the diagonal line. Uh, drives that uh, continue to work and produce silent errors are going to be below the line. So um, this particular plot shows that there, uh, most of the Intel drives fall along this line, however, um, a significant amount of drives, even um, even enter, uh, enterprise class drives, you can see, uh, will allow itself to reboot, and then have a silent error upon upon being rebooted. So, you, if I could, uh, so the argument then is maybe the, you know the competitor drives like, well, yeah, those Intel drives, they're, they hang all the time. Right? And you're like, well, yeah, we do that, so your data is good. They, you know, they come back, but the data is crap. Is that, is that? Yeah, uh, right. We break all the time. Because I, I can see them arguing yeah. that, you know, when they hang, the, well, the Intel drives, they, you know. They, they will break. Back. Yeah, they break. Right. right. And so, and so the, we're the, more reliable. Right. But the, but the answer to that is that the brick rate due to this from the previous slide mm -hmm. was substantially less than what the annual what the annual failure rate would be on the spec sheet. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're right. 
Yeah. I think we have other data that we probably don't have enough time to go through that shows <laughs> that our failure rates are significantly lower than our competitors as well. So, but that's a topic for the next time. Oh, good. We'll be back. And so the, the final slide on, on this particular topic is you can sort of try to decide, um, you know, what is, what is a good region to be in? Um, you don't want your silent data corruption rate to be too high. Um, this is the yearly silent data corruption rate. Um, at the same time, you also don't want your brick rate to be too high. So you can sort of imagine a box where you don't let your um, silent data corruption rate to be higher than, say, 0.001% per year. And your brick rate will be less than 0.1% a year, which is still one-fourth of the annual failure rate that's usually published in the spec sheet. And um, that would be a good measure to see if, if drives fall within this box. You can essentially say that you're meeting both your silent data corruption goals and meeting your brick rate goals and, or your failure rate goals. And um, so this is sort of a, a call to action that you know, manufacturers should be looking at this because this is not necessarily a problem that is um, so rare um, that, that it's not worth looking at. If, if you're OEMing these, um, are you giving other manufacturers the opportunity to um, have some decision making around what level of uh, bricking is acceptable to them? Yes. So <coughs> we, the, the, firm, the firmware um, has custom solutions <coughs> for, for different um, manufacturers. So the firmware policy can, can be different. And we can also provide unbricking tools um, also um, to customers as well. So any other questions? Otherwise, I'm going to turn it back over to James. Um, so the, the only thing, and, and it's probably a much bigger question than you have time for, but this concentrated primarily on um, data corruption at the time of write. There's also the other concept. And generally, when I use the term bit rot, which was the term you brought up earlier, I am referring to long-term data corruption you know, over time. Right. You didn't talk about that at all. And I am curious if there's data on flash versus, because I know what the hard drives do and tape drives. And, you know, so the question is, I don't know anything about what flash says yeah. in that regard. Yeah, yeah. So that's a concept of what we call data retention. Right. It's a little different, but we have a re really nice detailed white paper that we can give you. Great. And follow up, and it's real thick. <laughs> Put you to sleep, I'm sure. Might be surprised. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. But definitely Fair enough. put my wife to sleep. How's that? I think the bo the bottom line with the silent data corruption is that not all SSDs are the same, and uh, with the storage systems that we have today, and that's that's kind of where we go next. I mean, really, okay. So what? Well, there's a few so what's. Hopefully, you got the so what's. So what? At first, scale out storage is happening, and all flash is what makes that really a good value. So people are moving that way. And when they move that way, NVMe interface brings that great value better than other interfaces, <clears> and it's moving to future memory technologies like Optane. Now, as it was mentioned earlier, that leaves a big opportunity for software vendors to improve their code, to be able to take advantage of these lower <coughs> latency uh, in ingredients like Optane memory. And that is going to have to happen. You'll get great performance out of the box. It's only going to get better with time as people optimize their code. That's the good news. The next thing is... Silent data corruption is a real problem. Thank you, Howard. I, I really love that you agreed with me. It's a real problem. We really need your help to raise the awareness of how real this problem is. It's expensive. It's $5,600 a minute of downtime. And just because it's not old data doesn't mean it wasn't some of your application code that took your whole data center down. And by the way, people who buy SSDs, they're reading and writing them all the time. They're getting the value out of them. And they're not putting them in there for cold and archival storage. So there's always data moving in and out. So if you flip, a, it can only happen when you're moving data in and out. You're right. You're always moving data in and out, or you're not buying SSDs. Yeah, right? I didn't want it to, I wasn't minimizing the problem. I was just saying it's, they're two different problems. True, 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 true. Didn't mean to pick on you either. I apologize. It's okay. It's okay. Um, and um, so it's really important to understand the capabilities of your storage system. Some of them have end-to-end -end protection mechanisms. Uh, if you want to appreciate <coughs> the performance and not reduce the performance by turning those so solutions on, then you want to make sure you get the media 
that you can trust. This is really important. Otherwise, you're going to be flipping bits, and nobody wants to have to take that bill. So that's, that's what we had for today. Hopefully it makes sense. Was it useful? <laughs> if you use the Intel yes, assistance, it's was not it depressing. Useful? Yeah. It was really good. No, I mean, was, basically, yeah. you're making, you're gathering data and, and real data and not just, we're better than everybody else, but you're saying, and here's why. Yeah. Which is somewhat. That was. I was, was kind of hoping <clears throat> at the end you'd be like, and that's why we have this new thing and it solves <laughs> all of it. And No, that's why we have what we've been selling. We just haven't <laughs> right, been telling right. people enough yeah. about it. No, that's. Uh, that's uh, uh, selling tinfoil yeah. covers for rest. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's red covers for SSDs. Yep. Pre-built London rack size, you just slipped in the end. So we're kind of happy to have guys like, like Vinod on the team that can help us make sure we design the controllers to catch them. And then we have philosophies where management agrees that we'll turn it into a brick instead of give you the wrong data. And, and then we still fail at very, very low rates. So that's all good news. Yeah, so as Dave yeah. figured out, you guys need to come out with a colored ribbon for silent data corruption awareness. <laughs> we actually are working on it. <laughs> We're actually working on it. You'll I'm probably start to see some on. advertising campaigns, so feel free to. Uh, um, reserve the day. Yeah. There's a, a foundation to reserve National Data Corruption Awareness Day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah. Um, St. Patrick's Day. And tie it to the bow tie. <laughs> there you go. Bow ties are cool. Yeah, well, by the way, Justin, like data corruption on the same as drinking too much and forgetting what you did last night, right? Except the data corruption on yeah, St. Patrick's I, Day is not silent. I, I, <laughs> made, made a, I think it was Vinod. I think it was you that made a reference. I don't know. One of, you, one of you guys made a reference to things like XFS and and other things that check that do higher level checking. I definitely think it, it's also a real argument for that. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And, and and for and for larger checksums. I will, I will say, I, I, I knew, I've known the problem for a while. I've, I've never seen, I, you know, I hope you, you can share these slides because like those three, the three, I've never heard of those three instances that you had with the, uh, it was like Netflix. Yeah, the, the Netflix I've never and the heard of that. Amazon. They're, those are public blogs from their websites. Yeah. No, I, That's where we stole I, them I'm from. I'm curious, you know, I'd love to. that real quick. Yeah, you no, know, as the slides in general. I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to go. <laughs> You know, uh, you know. Whenever I had a failed restore, I'd go, "Well, the tape was broken." You know, so I wonder. You know, I wonder. Like, I'm like, did they really have silent data corruption, or just, right? You know, right. Did, was but the tape fine? It would, but it would the be data interesting. Was bad before you. Yeah, it, it would be interesting to see, like, how they, how or if they proved that that's what it was. You know There's I mean? a lot, a lot of detail in those okay. blogs, and, and then, and then all the testing that Vinod walked you through, and all the graphs and charts. There's a detailed IEEE. Uh, IEEE fellow validated a white paper. He's got a copy of it over there. The link was at the bottom of a couple of the slides. You can read through all the details of the testing. Um, but we think it's important, and we're fairly confident we're the only SSD vendor that does this testing because there's only two or three places in the world that can do it. And when we go, we ask them if any of these other companies have been in testing products lately. And It's not the kind of thing it. I'd expect from Mushkin. Certainly not. So you'll be able to share the slides with us relatively soon? Yeah, sure. That'd be awesome. These are approved, ready to go. So, <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your time, guys. I appreciate the attention. You. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Hope you're lucky and you have Intel SSDs in your storage. <laughs> <laughs> could do something about that. This is the most fun getting this geeky we've had in a long time.